Jeremy, it's an honor to have you here. Thanks. Thank you very much. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank uh, Eagle Technology and Microsoft for, for sponsoring my trip here. And uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm going to talk to you today not as an expert in IT. You folks are so far beyond me in that I, I can't uh, hold a candle to you. I want to talk to you as somebody who spent 20 years running a major American city. And exactly 20 years ago, I was inspired by a young guy in my IT department who had a vision for what our city could be if we developed an enterprise approach to GIS. And he inspired me. And that guy, that one IT specialist, transformed our city as a result of that vision that he had. And I wanted to share that with you today because I really believe that it's all about cities. National governments are important, but becoming less and less so. Urban, city, local government is becoming more and more the focus, especially with the challenges that we face, the financial challenges and especially the sustainability challenges, global warming and all these. These are really local issues. It's all about cities. And we live for the first time in history in the urban era, where half the people on the planet live in cities. The problem is, we can't keep running cities the way we did in the past. Very inefficient, stovepipe approach to management, looking at different departments, having different departments empowered and separate from each other. A transportation department, an economic development department, a public works department, a land use planning department, all making decisions in isolation, not realizing that each decision affects everything the city does. We have to take a whole new approach to urban management and urban planning. And I wanted to share with you our experience, our, our 20 years of utilizing GIS, developing GIS into an enterprise system that really helped transform our city and cope with some of these problems. And admittedly, our city is unusual. It's the entire island of Oahu that you see. It's a population of about a million people, and it's about 1,800 square kilometers. And you're probably familiar with the tourism section of our economy, the Waikiki area, just a portion of our city. Well, our challenge was that we faced an enormous recession uh, during the 90s because our economy tracked the Japanese economy. And so when the Japanese economy tanked, our economy tanked. And we lost $20 billion of real property value like that. And we run the city, basically, on real property taxes. And so that meant hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue wasn't coming in to provide city services. And yet our population continued to grow. Well, we made a decision. And it was a counterintuitive decision. Everybody was saying, you've got to cut back. You've got to lay off people. Cut back services. We said, no. We're going to invest in technology, IT technology, GIS technology, and by doing that, we're going to be able to not only maintain services, but actually increase and enhance services. And the idea, again, was to take a systems approach, to absolutely re-engineer the city and start running it as a system. And the only way you can do that, the only way you can take a systems approach, is if you have an enterprise-wide GIS system underlying the operation of the city so that GIS becomes the workspace for everybody in the city. The blue collar worker out in the field, the planner at the desk, the architect, all of them tied in with the same system, able to access all the same information, able to integrate the information and visualize the possibilities, the various scenarios of the decisions that they make. And so that was our plan, completely reorganize the city, invest in these new technologies. And that meant this enormous leap into GIS and putting every operation of the city onto GIS. And we began by absolutely re-engineering the city. I just threw away the entire city organization, all the departments and agencies, and started with a clean sheet of paper and said, how would you organize a city from a systems approach and utilizing GIS? And we came up with a whole new city organization 18 new departments, consolidated functions, integrated functions. And of course, we computerized 
virtually everything that we could. One of the areas we focused on, first of all, of course, was land use. We realized we needed to stop the urban sprawl that was spreading across our island, so we utilized our GIS system to develop a new secondary urban center on our island and develop urban growth boundaries so we could limit the growth, protecting open space and agricultural land. And using GIS to be able to analyze all of the different uh, properties available for this new urbanization, to be able to look at various scenarios for urban development, land use alternatives, to be able to integrate coastal zone management decisions as we planned uh, the new urban center, to be able to deal with some of the problems we had with building on slopes, again, by using GIS and being able to analyze topography and uh, slumping soils and the whole variety of infrastructure issues. And every time we make a, a decision on where we're going to place a new facility, obviously we use GIS to be able to look at sight lines, view planes, uh, sound uh, envelopes, all of that able to analyze, again, because we have an enterprise-wide uh, GIS system. Even simple things like giving out licenses to bars, anyone who sells alcohol, or anyone who's going to establish a, uh, uh, something that's going to uh, bring people together, uh, a church, anything like that. We analyze it with our GIS, looking at the demographic impacts on surrounding schools, neighborhoods, again, with noise, traffic considerations, able to make these decisions far better now because we're able to integrate all the data, visualize the impacts, and then make a much more informed decision. This, this virtual reality has really empowered our city people. Our economy, as I told you, tanked with the, with the Japanese economy, and so we had to start to rebuild Waikiki and the whole visitor industry. And again, we turned to GIS uh, to master plan the entire Waikiki Peninsula again, looking at buildings that were over 30 years old and susceptible to redevelopment, looking at different zoning codes, different land use codes, different uh, floor area ratios for what kind of density we wanted, what kind of, what kind of uh, structures we wanted, structure modeling. Again, GIS was instrumental not only for us, but allowing our visitor industry to utilize the technology as well. And one of our uh, huge problems, of course, was uh, permitting, as it is with most cities. Uh, huge backlogs, and again, GIS uh, came uh, to the rescue. Uh, being able to automate the whole system and have it on our GIS system so that people could bring in their plans, not as old blueprints that would move their way uh, slowly through all of the different departments, but bring their plans in on CAD, have every department being able to review the plans simultaneously, uh, be able to make changes and suggestions simultaneously, and have the applicant actually able to log on to our website and see all of the information that was there on the GIS system and all the changes that were being suggested to the plans by the various departments. Again, enormous uh, streamlining uh, impact. We also uh, wanted to change our urban design focus. We had allowed Honolulu to become sort of the homogenized U.S. city. You could have plunked down in Honolulu and you couldn't have told it, you wouldn't have been able to tell if you were uh, there or in uh, uh, Poughkeepsie. Okay, we'd lost our sense of place. And so we looked at how we could use GIS for these different future scenario modelings, for how we could change some of that uh, urban fabric with different kinds of uh, landscaping, different kinds of architecture. And when we implemented a bus rapid transit system, again, we used our GIS to visualize how we would make it more pedestrian friendly as the transit system went in by widening sidewalks, changing landscape, minimizing automobiles in our city. So with all of the different scenarios for redevelopment, we used our GIS to visualize the different future scenarios. When we looked at some of our our old existing neighborhoods that had lost their sense of place. We used our GIS again to look at how we could implement new codes that would transform these communities, make them more centered around people instead of automobiles, and recapture uh, the, the livability of the neighborhoods by certain kinds of infill architecture, by requiring certain kinds of, of uh, landscaping along the streets and pedestrian improvements. And with our transportation system, again, GIS was invaluable. Uh, being able to use GIS to do uh, all the trip generation analysis for 
uh, for our transportation systems to be able to analyze uh, our rapid transit systems, our bus systems, uh, changing uh, bus stops, bus routes, all of that. Uh, we could never have accomplished what we did uh, without an enterprise-wide GIS approach. Uh, using GPS smart bus technology on all of our uh, bus fleet uh, and of course uh, in, um, uh, also utilizing uh, uh, camera technology, video camera technology on all the key arterials and feeding that into our, our website and our GIS system so that you have live video feeds on all uh, the key areas of the island as traffic moves around the, uh, around the city and being able to access that in real time and integrate it with all the GIS information. And we even have, you know, taxi drivers driving around accessing our GIS uh, on, the, on the web, looking at the traffic ahead of them uh, through the cameras and being able to integrate that with all the other information that's available to every citizen in our city. Even the, the planning of our existing uh, traffic network, our, our roadway network, uh, much improved with GIS. Uh, in the past, with traffic engineers trying to visualize complex uh, you know, uh, 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 complex highway uh, intersections and uh, clover leaves. Uh, now, simply with the aerial uh, uh, visuals that they can call up for any area of the island, they can much better visualize the different changes that are necessary, the additions of lanes and whatnot. We even now insist that any project that we do that may have any negative connotation in the community, such as building a new jail or a sewage treatment plant, uh, we run that through our GIS environmental justice program. And basically what we had found in the past was, you know, subconsciously perhaps, but politically, we always ended up putting the bad things in the poor neighborhoods. The poor neighborhood was the, was the neighborhood that got the sewage treatment plant and the jail. It never seemed to go in, into the middle class neighborhood or the high end neighborhood. Well now, before we plan any facility, we run it through the GIS environmental justice uh, program and it works out all the demographics that you can imagine. And so we're able to make a reasoned, fair decision about where things get placed because we have that capability. Even such things as traffic markings, it seems mundane, but on an island that's 800 square kilometers, you can imagine how many traffic intersections and markings, what's there, now, how do you maintain it? How do you know what's there? We may have an accident on, on the other side of the island, and someone complains, well, it's because you don't have the turn signal lane marked appropriately. Well, instead of sending a crew halfway across the island to look and see what's there, uh, we simply call it up on our aerial inventory. You can see immediately what the markings are, and, and the engineers can decide, yes, we need to change the markings at that particular intersection. And GIS, of course, uh, we're promoting bicycle riding, trying to minimize the need for automobiles on the island. So all of our buses now have bike racks, but all of the bicycle routing, uh, all planned and uh, maintained on our GIS system. Economic development, uh, certainly uh, uh, GIS played an invaluable role. Uh, we uh, formed a partnership with our uh, our board of realtors. These are uh, private real estate agents who sell property. Uh, they came to the city, they saw enormous potential of working with the city uh, and its GIS system. And so at their expense, uh, they maintain this portion of our website. So basically, if you're interested in uh, doing business in Honolulu, instead of us sending a delegation out trying to woo you to our city, you can simply log on to our website. Uh, and we're getting, uh, for this part of our GIS system, we get about 2.7 uh, million hits a month. Um, but people will log on. You can find every piece of commercial property that's for sale in the city and find out any parameters about that. You can enter in all your variables, things you need in terms of uh, the, the size of the roadway in front, the kind of sewage capacity. Uh, you can call up any radius around the property and get a full demographic report. Who lives there? How much money do they make? How do they spend their money? What's the workforce going to be like? Are you going to be able to find employees? You can even call up the live television camera on the corner and look at the traffic going by if you'd like. But it, it gives us the ability to make a tremendous outreach worldwide for economic development uh, that we didn't have before, again, because of this enterprise approach uh, that we've taken. Uh, we also decided to uh, develop sports tourism as a major industry. 
and GIS was instrumental in planning all of our uh, new sports complexes, tennis complexes, soccer stadiums, uh, aquatic centers, all of that. And all of those plans developed with community input and all the plans on the GIS available for community uh, comment and, uh, uh, and involvement. In fact, even all of the trees of the city, some quarter million trees, are all inventoried on GIS. Uh, what kind of tree, uh, when it needs to be trimmed and fertilized and, uh, and what have you. Uh, a great improvement for a, from a management standpoint. And then, of course, the typical things that GIS is used for uh, property tax um, uh, management. Uh, our law requires that we appraise every piece of property each year to determine its market value uh, and then use that uh, as the basis of the tax levy. And so before we had this GIS system, you can imagine uh, the job that that was, a million people. I mean, it's a big city. Uh, and so now, of course, um, we have the standard things, the plot plan, the floor plan of your home. Uh, all of those things are all on the GIS. But every bit of sales data also goes into the GIS. So uh, to determine the value of your property, the computer simply uh, pulls out comparable pieces of property that were sold within a certain radius of your home uh, and calculates what those values were, uh, compares that to uh, the amenities that you have in your home, and spits out a value for what your property is worth. Uh, in the past, uh, we would often lose appeals, uh, people who said we made mistakes in evaluating uh, the value of their property for tax purposes. And now we win uh, uh, almost all of them because, again, uh, of this system. And of course, for those tax uh, contested cases that we do have, we use GIS as well for the analysis and for building our cases uh, to go to court to defend our valuation. And I would say probably our community involvement efforts in Honolulu were impacted more than anything else uh, by our GIS. GIS gave us the ability to really reach out into the community and bring community leaders and volunteers into the process of planning and, and visioning the future of their neighborhoods. Uh, every neighborhood on the island was provided with access to an electronic whiteboard uh, and SketchUp software that was integrated with our GIS system. So with 20 minutes of training, just anybody on the street could get up with the engineer or the architect and help design the new civic center or the new downtown redevelopment block or whatever it happens to be. And to be able to, you know, fly through the new design that they had just developed there in the community meeting, be able to do real-time walkthroughs of what they had just imagined there in the community and then integrate it with all of the hundreds of layers of GIS data for those pieces of property in terms of, in terms of uh, uh, the streets and the utilities and the view planes and all the rest. And of course with the, with the GIS uh, virtual fly-through capability that we have, uh, we have uh, basically uh, taken a, a virtual reality of our city and draped uh, all of the buildings uh, with, uh, with aerial photography. So with our GIS system, you can fly through Honolulu from, from any direction, from any elevation, uh, and get a real life uh, experience of that uh, fly through. So you can go down to the, down to the road, you can uh, follow a new transit route proposed, or perhaps there's a new high rise being proposed and you wanna look at the view planes and what impact is going to be happening there. Uh, maybe you want to fly up to a building and, and fly right in the window of the building and call up the floor plan uh, and find out who owns it and if they've paid their taxes. Or perhaps you want to uh, call up the blueprints uh, and find out uh, the construction drawings of the building uh, or the soils uh, or the, the property tax assessments. Uh, and our police department has made incredible use of GIS, being able to predict crime and interdict crime before it happens. They, they know, for instance, that uh, uh, perhaps on Friday afternoons there's a whole concentration of car thefts in a certain, on a certain block in our city. And so they know to send a police officer there, and in fact they've done exactly this. They've predicted crimes, sent police officers, and stopped the crimes um, as they were happening. Again, because they now have the ability 
to integrate all this data, to be able to visualize it and make uses that they never envisioned before. And of course, all the standard things, sewer lines, water lines, soils, uh, laterals, historic sites, historic buildings, uh, land purchase uh, information, sales, uh, areas we've designated as having great potential for redevelopment, that we want to provide incentives for redevelopment. And for our smart growth programs, um, in the past, our land use laws actually promoted urban sprawl, people moving further and further out onto our agricultural lands. Well, we want to stop that. We want to promote what we call smart growth, higher density mixed use, so people can live and work and shop and go to school all within a small radius, and they're not so dependent on the automobile. So how do we communicate these ideas to the public? Well, we look at a, a light industrial area such as this, and we say, well, how would we make this not an employment center that people have to drive to from two hours away where they live, but a place where they can live and work and, and, uh, and have a, a sustainable community? Well, the first thing we want to do is add the amenities that make a community, the, the lighting and the landscaping. We want to be able to provide apartments for people to live in and offices for them to work in and shops and grocery stores for them to shop at. And again, that fabric to build the community. So people can start to understand what we talk about. That when we say we want higher density mixed use, they're not afraid of it as some overdevelopment idea, but actually the creation of a livable, sustainable neighborhood. And the roadways that became the long arterials with used car lot after used car lot, how do we change those as well? Again, using GIS to illustrate the potential with the right kinds of infill architecture, focusing less on the car, more on the, uh, on the, uh, the bicycle. And again, trying to be able to visualize for people what the different ideas are that we're talking about for their neighborhoods. And our infrastructure was in, uh, was in a very uh, a bad way, and of course GIS has been invaluable to us in that regard as well. Our whole water system uh, is on GIS, all the planning, uh, the operation, the maintenance, uh, the monitoring of consumption, all that through a whole uh, incredible network of GIS uh, programs. And again, uh, consumption down to every lateral. Uh, our workers uh, don't even have to come to, uh, to the office. They simply can go to the field with their handheld computers, uh, call up you know, the, uh, the fire hydrant that they need to fix that day, all the details, uh, make the improvements, enter the information in, automatically the whole GIS system is updated, uh, all done uh, from the field uh, by these blue collar workers. And uh, the same is true, of course, uh, uh, with our wastewater as well. Uh, electronic meter reading, instead of going door to door to read the water meters, all that now is done electronically through telemetry, saving huge amounts of money. Our sewer flow analysis, all done on GIS, uh, the information system for our wastewater, uh, all there, uh, and of course, we've coupled that with other technologies, uh, specialized wastewater treatment uh, technologies, uh, SCADA monitoring systems, uh, data acquisition systems. So instead of having to keep large numbers of workers uh, employed 24 hours a day, seven days a week, ready to respond to a sewage spill, having it all done electronically, uh, there is a perturbation somewhere in the system, an emergency pump automatically kicks on, and the GIS system is able to integrate it all. Uh, tied in with remote controlled unmanned submarines, video cameras down in the sewer lines, uh, the whole nine yards. But again, investing in technology, micro tunneling technology uh, to, to put in the water lines and the sewer lines instead of digging trenches through the old city streets, saving millions of dollars. And uh, even recycling wastewater with uh, ultraviolet uh, disinfection and special Sinegro systems to recycle the solids for agriculture. Again, investing in technology paid off for us in so many ways. Uh, even our uh, storm drain uh, system, and again, the same situation. Uh, these workers don't even have to come to the city. They simply uh, go out uh, every morning with their little handhelds. Every, every uh, manhole on the island has a barcode on it, so they simply swipe the barcode and up comes the, the plans uh, and the maintenance schedule of that manhole. They make their improvements, uh, enter it in right there in the field, and automatically the whole system is updated. And this is the point that a lot of people say, well, how in the world can you afford to maintain the GIS system, all the data entry? And that's missing the point. The point is, 
it saves us money, it doesn't cost us money, because the GIS becomes the context that people are working in. It is the space that they're working in. In the past, these workers would have had to drive to City Hall, get their work assignments, drive out to this manhole, do the work, and then drive back to City Hall and type up a report. And then that report would be in some file cabinet somewhere, and nobody would be quite sure if this manhole had been cleaned or not. Now, they're in the field. All that travel is cut down, and as they're doing the work, the system is updated and the entire city knows that this has been maintained. The, the cost of maintaining the GIS system is actually a savings to the city. Our solid waste as well, uh, aggressive recycling programs, recycling uh, plastic for park benches and glass for glass fault, and the city developed a, uh, a special refuse-derived fuel power plant where we recycle what we can't recycle, we recycle and turn, turn it into energy and electricity, which we sell back to the power grid. And again, our whole solid waste management system, all the routing is all uh, on GIS and maintained and managed through its GIS system. Uh, energy, another area we focused on. Uh, our goal is to try to uh, reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. So we focused on energy efficiency, um, uh, shifting to renewable energy and distributed energy systems. Simple things like changing out the light bulb in the traffic signal to a light emitting diode instead of a, an incandescent bulb saves us a quarter million dollars a year. Uh, field testing uh, lights that don't plug in at all, it's a little wind turbine that hangs down and a photovoltaic cell on top that powers a battery. Uh, and even simple things as well like converting our entire city fleet of trucks uh, to biodiesel, basically running our trucks on used McDonald's french fry oil. Uh, all simple things, but in total, uh, all designed to reduce costs, improve efficiency, and reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. We even built a cogeneration power plant in our city hall and cut our demand for energy from the grid by 80%. Uh, tapping waste methane from sewage treatment plants for energy generation. And again, GIS is, is, is through all of these programs, all of these initiatives. We've mapped on our GIS system all the wind resources of the island. So we can decide where to place windmills and we can now take into consideration view planes, residential areas, noise envelopes, all these things can be analyzed before the decision is made to place a wind farm. And of course the same is true, we have all of our solar resources on our GIS system as well. Uh, one final uh, area that we've uh, made great use of our enterprise-wide GIS system is in public safety and security. And what I wanted to do is just run through uh, a, an imaginary uh, civil defense threat that is coming to Honolulu. Uh, let's say there's a hurricane uh, headed to our island. Uh, we're expecting enormous amounts of rain in the next 24 hours, and there's been uh, an earthquake in the Aleutians, and there's a possible tsunami on its way to the island as well. Well, we would activate, of course, the Civil Defense Headquarters, and I would then kick in this uh, enterprise-wide GIS system. Um, all of the operation and management of the disaster would be done through this enterprise-wide GIS system. In the past, different emergency response agencies would be in the field, and they wouldn't necessarily know exactly what their responsibilities were. Sometimes they would work at cross-purposes, duplicating efforts of other agencies. Sometimes they wouldn't know exactly what the status of the emergency was. Now everybody is on our GIS uh, integrated incident response system. So they know exactly what's happening to the moment and what their responsibilities are. We would call up our civil defense districts and activate them, call in satellite imagery of, on our GIS of the area of the island that was likely to be hit by the tsunami. Um, we would call up perhaps the satellite weather uh, and Doppler radar to see what the rainfall is likely to be on that portion of the island. And we would call up perhaps the critical facilities that may be impacted uh, by the storm. Uh, perhaps we would uh, be concerned about uh, one of the major water tanks serving Waikiki. So we would call that up with aerial uh, visual and, uh, and then maybe fly into that and call up its building blueprints to see if it was going to be able to withstand a class five hurricane. If it was doubtful, maybe we want to reroute water systems so that we don't rely on this for emergency response. 
We would want to locate, of course, all the emergency services that are going to be in the area that's going to be hit and identify all the flood prone, er uh, flood -prone areas uh, as a result of the rain, the hurricane, and potentially the tsunami. And in those areas uh, that uh, may be susceptible to localized flooding because of the rain, we would call up that, uh, that information that those workers put in just this afternoon, which storm drains did they clean and which ones didn't they clean. Uh, and so we might be able to send crews out in advance of the storm to get those cleaned so that we don't have uh, flooding in those neighborhoods. And then we may look at uh, what the actual run-up uh, might be of the tsunami, what parts of the island may be inundated. And with our GIS system, uh, we can determine now exactly what the evacuation plan is going to be. We look at the inundation that's going to happen, and then we already have in our system what the evacuation uh, shall be. The, the red buildings, we know we can evacuate people vertically into the higher floors. Uh, the salmon-colored buildings, we have to evacuate them uh, horizontally out of the area. And so we call up on our GIS all the evacuation routes, and uh, perhaps we want to use GIS to fly along those evacuation routes with our uh, visual uh, imagery uh, to make sure there are not any unforeseen problems that we haven't considered. We might want to look at one of the buildings we've designated for a vertical evacuation and uh, fly in the window of that and see if, in fact, it's going to be able to accommodate the number of people in those higher floors that we are sending there. Or maybe, again, call up the blueprints to see if it's going to be able to withstand a Class 5 hurricane. We want to call up on our GIS the emergency shelters. And uh, once I order the evacuation, then we'll look at all the live television uh, cameras on our GIS to see that the evacuation is proceeding uh, out of the, uh, uh, the impacted area. And use our uh, integrated uh, computerized traffic synchronization uh, uh, system to make sure all the lights are green, basically going out of the, of the, uh, of the area that's going to be hit. Uh, we have on our GIS the location of every person on the island that's on life support uh, at a care center or a, a daycare or at a hospital or whatever. And so we call that up on GIS. And then using our uh, uh, GIS system, we know what the fire and, and ambulance response times are to every one of those areas uh, on the island. So we can call that up and do that analysis. Uh, we want to set up roadblocks to keep people coming out, coming back into that area. And again, that's all on GIS, as well as locating the hazardous material that may be uh, affected once the storm hits. We may want to provide some hardening for those facilities or relocate some of that hazardous material. And if there is hazardous material, then we would turn that over to our hazmat response teams uh, in the fire department. And of course, they are fully equipped to deal with any kind of biological, chemical, or radiological a disaster. Uh, we may have fires if the hurricane hits. Uh, again, we want to locate all those hydrants, and again, we would call up the maintenance schedule on all the hydrants and laterals in that area to make sure they were all a go and ready for the disaster. Um, we would locate all of our emergency equipment, ambulances and fire trucks and whatnot, on our GPS system, and we would be able to watch them real time move through the city, picking up people on life support and responding to the emergency. And of course, all of our emergency response is on our computer-aided dispatch, uh, so our, coupled with our GPS system. So GPS is determining the location of every piece of emergency equipment, and the computer-aided dispatch is determining which piece of equipment can respond in the shortest period of time, taking into consideration one-way streets and traffic lights uh, and what have you. Uh, we would probably want to identify utilities that were going to be affected, uh, power lines, transmission lines, and all the rest, communication networks, we would call those up. We may have a bomb uh, uh, scare in the middle of all this. We would be able to analyze with our modeling uh, what area would be impacted should there be a blast, uh, both uh, vertically and horizontally. That may impact one of the buildings we're evacuating people to. So we might want to change our evacuation program as a result of that evaluation. And if there's going to be uh, uh, the release of any dangerous material, uh, we would do with our GIS system a plume analysis to see what other areas of the city might be impacted by those toxic materials. And our police department with its mobile command and control uh, has all of this capability uh, in mobile form so they can go to the site and they have full access to the enterprise-wide GIS. Uh, and the fire department has a complete uh, mobile weather station that it can also move to the site. All of the police vehicles have mobile data terminals so they have 
Every police officer has full access to uh, everything uh, within the uh, GIS system. And we have fixed um, uh, terrorist uh, uh, facilities around the island that are monitoring the air for the release of any biological or chemical uh, weapon. So uh, uh, you know, ricin or the plague uh, or botulism or whatever, uh, if it's released, it's picked up by these systems and then our GIS can do the plume analysis to determine what areas need to be evacuated. So the result of all this was that even though we faced this incredible challenge, uh, we were able to meet it and I attribute our success to our investment in technology, especially this, this underlying uh, enterprise-wide geographic information system. We saw an enormous increase in government efficiency, uh, a movement towards a, a more paperless city. Uh, we had no website at the beginning, and we ended up with the best website in the United States as part of our GIS. And we're getting 13 to 17 million hits a month on our website for city information and city services. Uh, online problem reporting, e-commerce activities, registering your car, all the rest. And so even though we faced this enormous drop in revenue, we were able to provide more services and significantly drop the number of city workers it took to provide those services. We actually, over 11 years, reduced the size of the city workforce by almost 9%. We didn't fire anybody, simply as people left and passed away, we would reorganize around the technology. And so even though our workforce went down by almost 9%, the main employment sectors in the city, police and fire, emergency response, they all went up. We had more police officers, more firefighters, and still the overall size of the workforce went down by almost 9%. And we were able to keep the operating the budget of the city almost flat for 11 years. Now typically, every decade in the past, historically, the city budget would go up 150% over 10 years. This is what it did over those 10 years, almost flat, phenomenal. And yet, our population went up, we served more people, more police officers, we built new police stations, more firefighters, we built new fire stations, we dramatically improved our parks and expanded our city parks and we were noted as one of the 10 best managed cities in the United States with one of the best police departments, one of the best fire departments, the best website that I mentioned before, one of the safest cities, the best transit system in the United States, and our bond rating went up to a strong double A so we can now finance infrastructure much more inexpensively. People warned that we were gonna bankrupt the city. The result was just the opposite. We saved money, we increased efficiency, and the credit rating of the city went up, and we were rated the most technologically advanced city in the United States. All of this, I believe, because we invested in technology, mainly IT technology, mainly enterprise-wide GIS. And it was largely because we had an IT technician 20 years ago who had a vision and had the courage to become a champion for that vision. And that person made an enormous difference in our city. And I want to thank you for the chance to talk to you today. Thanks very much. Thank you. Hello, um, that's pretty impressive. I was just wondering, how many layers of government do you have in Honolulu? Well, we're fortunate. We only have one. Uh, in Honolulu, the entire island is both the city and the county. I guess the county would be equivalent to your regional government. So it's all one entity. So there's one mayor, and we also have the advantage of, uh, we have what's called a strong mayor form of government. The mayor is the chief executive officer. He's elected at large. Uh, he's the equivalent of a CEO of the corporation, and he hires and fires everyone in the city. The city council is a separate legislative body that's not involved in the management of the city. So you have basically centralized authority 
without overlapping jurisdictions that's so common in many jurisdictions? Uh, at an, I suppose, national level, um, EPA, did you get any EPA data into there, or how, how would that kind of stuff happen? E EPA, we're required, of course, to follow uh, federal regulations. We don't get financial support from the feds, um, but we, we have to meet their Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, all the basic uh, uh, you know, uh, regulations regarding environmental standards. Uh, but in many cases, um, you know, we develop programs that go far beyond uh, the national government. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? He's, uh, he's, he's running the GIS uh, operation for the city. He's still there. He's not mayor, but you never know. <laughs> um, how, how did you avoid the comments we've heard earlier today about the, another u um, IT initiative and, and the malaise that goes with that? Because everything seems to have been successful, um, and that's quite unusual. Right. Well, there was enormous amounts of, of, uh, of objection at the beginning. Uh, most departments didn't want to share data. They didn't see any advantage to them. They're very protective of their data. Some departments, like police, didn't see what they had to do with any of this in the first place, and so didn't want to be bothered with it. And it really, was, it really required me pulling everybody together and saying, this is the way it's going to be. There are some advantages to being able to hire and fire everyone. And that's one of the advantages. <laughs> but what I found out was the people who were most uh, objective, uh, most, uh, most offering most of the objections at the beginning ended up being the biggest proponents in the end. Police department, for instance, they are some of the strongest advocates for GIS now because every day they're finding new applications that they never considered. The virtual fly-through, for instance. At one period, they had what they thought was a sniper situation in a high-rise. Turned out not to be, but that's what they thought. And then it occurred to them, we'll use GIS. We'll fly around the top of that building We'll fly in the window of that building. We'll figure out what the trajectory can be of the bullets so we know where to place our police officers. We'll be able to see what the floor plan is of where the guy could be hiding in what rooms. And so just on the fly, they're coming up with creative ways to use and visualize information. That, and we didn't plan that virtual fly through so police could look for you know, snipers in high rises. But that's the sort of thing that every day comes from the grassroots of the people that are using it. And so they get excited. They become the champions. And so you, know, you have to hold them back now because they're so enthusiastic. But that, that initial phase, because any, any GIS uh, enterprise-wide system is basically investment up front with virtually no benefit in the first year. And what happens is, as time goes, the cost goes down dramatically and the benefits go up. And there's a period a few years out when the curves cross. And, and you have huge benefits and very little ongoing cost. And, and of course, that's where we are now. But getting those initial investments up front, getting people to buy in, getting people to take time out of their busy schedules to focus on this new initiative that they didn't quite understand was difficult. There's no question about it. But it, uh, it certainly paid off for us. Uh, Paul Hughes, Doc. Um, you're a population of a million. Uh, that's a little larger than most of our um, local government entities in New Zealand. Um, do you have any comments about the issue of scale and how what you've just described might apply to somewhat smaller communities? Right. I, I work with cities all around the world, uh, and many cities uh, throughout the Asia region, and uh, the scale really is not that important. Um, of course, there are certain applications that are, that are sort of unique to a city of a million. Uh, but the reality is the, the enterprise-wide approach 
works, whether it's a city of 100,000 or, or, or 2 million. Because basically what it is, it does all the same things. It allows you to integrate enormous amounts of data from different, different places and to be able to visualize alternatives and to manage things more efficiently. So while the, the, the type of applications may differ in terms of you know, traffic trip generation models and things like that, the benefits from taking an enterprise-wide approach are, are, are available for any size community. And the investment is worth it. I, I talk with mayors and they say, oh, we can't possibly afford it. The reality is they can't afford not to do it. In today's world, cities are so complex. They're so complex. You simply can't run them from the seat of your pants like we used to years and years ago. It's far too complex. The issues are changing too quickly and they're far too serious. Uh, you know, energy issues, global warming issues. We're facing uh, urban challenges like we've never had before. And you can't run a city effectively uh, without a system uh, such as this, I, I believe. And the, and the sad thing is, if I just add to that, is in most cases, it's not beyond the capability of the city to do it. It's just beyond the vision. And the problem is the disconnect between the specialists who understand the potential of the system and the political leadership who doesn't get it. Most politicians I deal with, they don't know what that's about. It's a bunch of jargon and they're, they're uncomfortable with it because they, they can't interpret it. They're unfamiliar with it and so they don't want to get involved. And so your challenge as experts is to be able to translate the jargon into the kinds of everyday stuff. And we heard some great examples today. Being able to, to get it down, yeah, we say you have to get it down where the goats can eat it because that's what you're dealing with with politicians, you know. But, but you have to get it down so they understand and they will immediately see the political advantages because there are enormous political advantages to this stuff. All this gee whiz stuff and improving operations and cutting costs and expanded service, these are the milk of, of politics, right, Gary? That's, this is what makes, you know, politicians uh, grin. But they have to understand it. They have to understand it. And it, and it gets lost to them in the, in the, uh, in the jargon. And so uh, I think that's one of the big challenges we have is inspiring uh, local leadership so they understand the potential. Sorry, Robert Gibb, down here, Landcare Research. Uh, in recent floods that we have had uh, in New Zealand, well, I say recent, a few years ago now, um, there were both examples of mobile uh, systems being both the saviour of the day in, in some sense, but also of being the first point of failure. Uh, and I was wondering whether there are any particular um, things you had to take, or precautions you've had to take in order to be able to harden up some of the mobile systems, since in the end, that's very much what you're relying on in the, in the emergency response uh, area in, in, in disaster situations. Right. Well, first of all, we have we have complete backup systems that are hardened on another part of the island and all the rest. So the, uh, the mobile command and control uh, that we have for emergencies, uh, we can actually operate uh, uh, just as well, well not quite just as well, well we, can, we can operate quite fine even if that goes down because of the capability in the field that we have. Every police officer has access to the GIS with his mobile data terminal in his, in his police car. Every one of these workers has a handheld computer uh, and so, we, so we, we have the communication ability even if the big fancy police van isn't there with all of the, you know, the bells and whistles. Um, so we're not left in the dark if, if that happens to go down. The cell towers themselves, where the where the transmission infrastructure is, is you know, can be one of the things, first things to go down sometimes. Yes, that's or, right, and we've or, or the handhelds that aren't actually as as waterproof as they should be. Yeah, yeah, and and the reality is, whenever there's an emergency, something always goes wrong, um, and so you lose a portion of the network or, or somebody's this and that, um, and we've just tried to to back up things as as best we can. We've shifted all of our communication to 800 megahertz. Um, so we have now coverage that we never had before uh, with, our, uh, with all of our emergency response teams. Um, 
but a, a good questions and, and a vulnerability to any system, to be sure. Yes. Um, Don Hansen from Statistics New Zealand. Um, it all sounds like it's turned out great in the end, but um, in the early years, were there a lot of um, mistakes made, expensive mistakes, were there lessons learned? Yes, there were a number of mistakes. I, I made probably the biggest mistake uh, from a management standpoint. At the beginning, I just saw dollar signs when I saw all this data. I thought, well, we can sell this data. We can sell this layer to the, these people and this. And so my management approach was to, for us to hold all the data and to sell the layers to the different industry sectors. And that was a terrible decision because what that basically did was close down the growth of the system. And once I realized that mistake, we did exactly the opposite. We opened it up. So our whole GIS system is available on the web. So any citizen can log on, has full access uh, to it. And so it's invaluable now to the engineers and the architects and the planners and, you can, and the realtors and all these other people. It's the basis of their operations, really, because they have full access to all this information. And the general public, you know, you get community leaders now who who, you know, they log on to see the latest proposal for the redevelopment of the block and they can uh, uh, call up and, and do their, uh, uh, you know, do their car registration. I mean, all these things. So that was the biggest mistake, trying to hold the data. It, it may be counterintuitive. What you do is you open it up, give it away, and what happens is you're able to get other data layers come in from other uh, entities, uh, and you're able to get community support for the whole system and political support, and it becomes uh, a motherhood issue that no one would think of, of cutting. Uh, Gordon Stevenson, New Zealand Trade and Enterprise. Um, you've got such a comprehensive uh, technology environment. Um, how hard was it to develop the people skills or attract the people skills to design, develop, implement, manage and maintain such a huge integrated environment? Yeah, well, it was hard at first. It, you know, when I first started, we had one facsimile machine in the entire city and only one person knew how to use it. And so we would schedule three days in advance, you know, the facsimile to come in from Washington, D.C., and we'd have to bring the person in on overtime uh, to be able to run the equipment to be able to, I mean, that's, that's where we started. No computers anywhere in the city. I mean, so we started at zero or below. Um, and now we're the most technologically advanced city in the country. So we went through an enormous, you know, leap in that period. And part of the problem we had was we didn't have trained people. Um, and till today, it's very difficult for us uh, to attract you know, the, the kind of people that we need, not only for, for IT skills, but engineering skills and all the rest. Um, because when the economy is good, we can't compete with government salaries with private sector. And something has to be done about that. You know, I guess every jurisdiction is different. But typically, the salaries that are paid to government employees are significantly below private sector salaries. And, and you know, doing these jobs is perhaps, are the, perhaps the most important jobs. These government sector jobs are perhaps the most important jobs and we need to be able to reward those people with, with uh, pay packages and, and benefits that are commensurate with the, with the contribution they make. So that is difficult. But our whole GIS operation is only 18 positions. So, you know, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not a cast of thousands. Yes. Thinking back to 20, 25 years ago when you had your vision, what's the sort of key thoughts that come back in terms of what the vision was and how it's now, now come into fruition? And what was the key bits of translation from your, your bright IT person with the idea? Right. Well, back then, GIS was, uh, was viewed very differently. GIS was viewed pretty much as a mapping tool, and it was viewed as a way to improve the the planning department's uh, operation. But a few people uh, who were, especially people who had, had had a chance to meet Jack Dangerman, the, the, the president of, uh, of ESRI, um, 
started to realize the broader potential uh, of using it as a decision-making tool, of integrating all these different operations and maintenance. Um, and it was basically me being exposed to those ideas and seeing the possibility uh, that allowed us to go ahead. But it was because, really, IT people had the, had the vision, saw what could be done, and were willing to go to the political leadership and convince them of what the potential was. If that step hadn't happened, then, uh, then we wouldn't have made the investment. We wouldn't have, have, have done what we did. But it was that step of, of going from the IT professionals to the political leadership to be able to show the potential and to get it down where the goats could eat it, to so understand what the potential was without the jargon. Any other questions? Thank you very much for your kind attention. Why don't you take a three-minute stretch break? <laughs> <laughs>